The biomedical engineering program recently moved into new lodgings in January of 2013. Um, our program is housed on the third floor of Institute Hall, where you'll find our two main teaching labs, also referred to as the wet and dry lab, that have been designed to support a variety of different laboratory experiments. We also have six 750 square foot faculty research labs, a high-end computing research lab, as well as space for student projects. We also have additional space found on our A-level and on the fourth floor. This is a laboratory experiment for the introduction to biomedical engineering course. In this uh, particular laboratory experiment, the students are being exposed to three different concepts. The first concept is going to be microfluidics. The second concept is flow regimes. And the third one is mass transfer by diffusion. Microfluidics is a rapidly growing field. It's a still a new field. And it refers to the application of a small micro devices to perform analysis. It has important advantages over normal system because when we use a microfluidic device, we can get results in a matter of minutes. So this is something that is going to become more important in the future. A lot of the normal analysis that we do nowadays in the future are going to be performed in microfluidic devices. Another important advantage that they have is that they require a very little sample. That is important, especially for biomedical engineering samples, when sometimes the sample that we have is very scarce. Uh, one example given to the student is, imagine that we have to do the blood analysis in a premature baby. The amount of blood available, it is very little. So if we are able to perform those analysis with a tiny sample, it's a much better option. The second concept that was introduced to the student was flow regimes. We talked during this laboratory experiment that we have laminar flow and turbulent flow. It was important for the student to get to know this subject because later on they're going to take a class on fluid mechanics called continuum mechanics. The third concept that was introduced in this laboratory experiment was mass transfer by diffusion. In particular, we used two different dyes. Those dyes were introduced in a small micro channel that the students created employing gelatin. In this micro channel that had the shape of a Y, the student had two inlet pores so they could see how the dyes will mix slowly inside the channel. By observing the interface between the two dyes, the students were able to see the power of the fusion. So one exciting class of biomaterials are hydrogels. Hydrogels are networks of either synthetic or natural polymers that absorb and swell with water. These materials have a variety of applications, but there's two very exciting ones within biomedical engineering. One is tissue engineering. These networks of polymers help provide scaffolds for cells to grow on and in vitro tissues and organ constructs. They also allow passageways for nutrients and small molecules to diffuse to and from the cells. Additionally, hydrogels are often used in controlled release drug capsules. For example, drugs that are taken orally are designed to typically dissolve and release the drug inside either the mouth or the stomach or the digestive tract. The properties of the hydrogel can be optimized for a time release, and this can be based upon pH, salt concentration, or another physiological parameter. In the Intro to BME course, one of the laboratories the students complete is a hydrogel lab. The students explore the swelling properties of hydrogels as a function of salt concentration. While hydrogels, as we just discussed, are used in tissue engineering and drug release, they're also used in a lot of common consumer products, including shampoos and the foods we eat, but also diapers. So in this laboratory, we use infant diapers which are loaded with a highly absorbent hydrogel called polyacrylic acid. The students investigate absorbency of the diapers in solutions with varying salt concentrations, which is also referred to as osmolarity. The solutions we use range from deionized water with no salt to a buffer that mimics blood plasma, all the way up to a buffer that's equivalent to concentrated urine. The students find there's a strong nonlinear relationship between how much solution the diaper will hold and the osmolarity of that solution. In 1903, 
a Dutch doctor and scientist, measured the first practical electrogram, or ECG, which was the first step forward towards modernization of biomedical instrumentation. Today, there are hundreds of sophisticated biomedical instruments available to physicians and patients in the hospital or at home. In the heart ECG and sound demo, the students will learn about the electromechanic structure of the heart. They use modern ECG and heart sound recording system and record a digital representation of these phenomena in the PowerLab software. Then they measure ECG signals as the electrical properties of the heart and heart sounds as a measure of the mechanical structure of the heart. The students measure ECG in both relaxing and movement situation to see how the artifact stores the ECG data. At the end, the students will compare the electrical properties of the ECG with their corresponding heart sounds that they recorded from their lab partner. In musculoskeletal biomechanics, students learn the basics of statics and mechanics and their application to the musculoskeletal system. In the first laboratory in this class, students create models of the knee and the elbow joint. They investigate the significance of the insertion point, its angle, and how that affects force generation. From this laboratory, students then explore muscle force generation in the actual human body. They're asked to investigate antagonistic pairs using electromyography or EMG measurements. EMG is the measurement of the electrical potential of activated muscle cells. Students choose which antagonistic pairs they wish to study. Then they must choose the range of motion that would demonstrate that the muscles have opposing behavior. In the third year of the program, we have a two-core sequence systems physiology one and systems physiology two that really serve to look at human physiology from both a quantitative and a systems point of view. And it's important that the students actually get to experience uh, that level of system integration by going ahead and making measurements uh, for example, here we're going ahead and uh, instrumenting the students to measure electrical activity in the cerebral cortex uh, using a device um, that allows us to measure the EEG or electroencephalogram. And the students uh, hopefully have valid brain waves and we uh, extract those brain waves and actually allow the students to make quantitative assessments relative to uh, their state of consciousness, if you will. Um, so live uh, information and taking that information and uh, making quantitative measurements. And as you can see, it's a very interactive uh, and very pleasant experience. The other uh, aspect of uh, system physiology is the fact that we're taking the data and analyzing it uh, very carefully uh, and it's important for the students to recognize that there's a great deal of variability here we're actually measuring pulmonary uh, capabilities again using the students to provide the data and uh, providing quantitative assessment of their behavior and looking at the variation across the, a population of students.